the greatest Indy 500 of all time? It happened in 1963. Now stay tuned for the greatest spectacle in racing. You know, every time I pick up this book, I'm transported 50 years back in time and half a world away. To an eight-year-old car-crazed kid growing up in Adelaide, South Australia, the Indy 500 seemed as far away and exotic as Monaco, or the moon for that matter. The 10 guys lined up behind the car all look quietly pleased with themselves. And there's this dude in a jacket and necktie and cowboy hat, leaning over the cockpit, flashing a Hollywood smile. He's JC Agajanian, the car owner. The guy in the cockpit's smiling as well, and so he should. You see, Parnelli Jones had just won what I believe is the greatest Indy 500 of them all. But to me, Parnelli's car was the star. It was one of the most beautiful race cars I'd ever seen. It was different from the 1960s Grand Prix cars I adored, bigger, brawnier, and even back then I understood its simple suspension and front engine layout were crude by comparison. But with perfect proportions and stance, Hallibrand wheels held on with three corner knockoffs, and the big bore chrome exhaust pipe along the left hand side, the Watson Roadster just looks so right, and it still does. Parnelli says the name comes from an old football joke about a running back who repeatedly fails to take the ball. The coach, despairing of losing the game, says to the quarterback, why don't you give Calhoun the ball? The quarterback turns around and says, but coach, Calhoun don't want the son of a bitch. At least that's the way Parnelli tells it. It seems a curious name to give a car that took Parnelli Jones to the greatest win of his career in what I believe to be the greatest Indy 500 ever run until you look at the record books. On the four occasions Jones drove number 98 at the Brickyard, 1961 through 1964, he led the race, but the car let him down three times. Most cruelly in 1962, when a cracked header melted the tape holding the brake line to a chassis tube on the left of the car, forcing him to retire after leading all but six of the first 125 laps. And although Parnelli led most of the way in the 1963 500, that victory was a nail biter. Maybe old Calhoun really didn't want the son of a bitch. That old Calhoun could make its debut at Indy in 1960 and still be a front runner in 1964 speaks volumes about the capabilities of its designer, AJ Watson but it also says a lot about the curious state of the Indy 500 at the time. Since the very first 500 mile race in 1911, Indianapolis had showcased plenty of technological innovation. But by the time old Calhoun rolled out of Watson's shop in Los Angeles, the winning formula at Indy had become, well, formulaic. All 33 cars in the 1960 race were essentially evolutions of traditional dirt track races designed before World War II with rugged tube frames and simple beam axles, front and rear. All were powered by the four-cylinder, 4.2-litre Mayer Drake Offenhauser, an engine originally designed in the early 1930s. All had a two-speed transmission built from Ford Model A parts. But as Pennelly Jones led the field on the parade lap that 1963 Memorial Day, there was revolution in the air at the brickyard. On the second row of the grid for America's great race was a tiny cigar-shaped car with an aluminum monocoque chassis and fully independent suspension all round. And bolted to the rear of the car, behind the driver, was a 4.2-litre production block Ford V8. Scotsman Jim Clark, taking time out from winning the Formula One World Championship that year, had qualified the Colin Chapman-designed Lotus 29 at 149.750 miles per hour, fifth fastest overall. Rear engine cars like the Lotus and Mickey Thompson's Chevy powered specials challenged the very idea of the traditional Indy Roadsters. But the Roadster runners were themselves also embroiled in an unusually fierce technical battle during qualifying. After years of stasis, tyres had become the hot button issue 
at the brickyard. The Roadsters had traditionally run tall, narrow tyres on 16-inch front and 18-inch rear wheels. But Panelli Jones had been intrigued with the new wide-section 15-inch stock car rubber he'd been testing for Firestone, and figured a wider footprint made sense at Indy, where lateral grip was obviously important. The Firestone engineers patronisingly rejected the idea. But having seen the Lotus arrive at the brickyard on 15-inch rubber, Jones ordered some 15-inch Halibrand wheels anyway and had them fitted to number 98. On May 11, he ran a stunning 152 mile an hour lap and another two in the 150 mile an hour bracket, each faster than the laps that had put him on pole for the 1962 race. That settled it. On May 12, just five days before qualifying began, roadster mechanics all over Gasoline Alley were grinding down brake calipers so they'd fit inside 15 inch wheels. Race day and 275,000 fans jammed the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. As expected, Jones, who'd qualified on pole at 151.153 miles per hour, led the pack away from the start. But his good friend Jim Herterbees, whose supercharged Novi V8 powered Curtis was fearsomely fast in the long shoots, stormed past after a slow start and led the opening lap. Jones grabbed the lead back on lap two and settled down to controlling the race from the front. Jim Clark's Little Lotus couldn't match old Calhoun's raw speed, but it was nimble through the traffic and much easier on fuel and tyres than the big, heavy, more powerful roadster. When Parnelli Jones made his first pit stop on lap 64, Clark's Lotus, which would not need to stop until lap 95, was about to make racing history. On lap 67, it became the first car powered by a stock block engine to lead the Indy 500 since before World War I. And it became the first rear engine car ever to lead at the brickyard. Jones would have to stop twice more on laps 128 and 162. It was enough to put Clark within striking distance in the closing stages of the race. Worse, a cracked lubricant tank had left the 98's tail smeared in oil and drivers spinning in its wake. Jones was nearly black flag from the lead with just 10 laps remaining as the Little Lotus closed within eight seconds of oil streaked old Calhoun. Had number 98's owner JC Agajanian not talked Indy officials out of waving the black flag, the gifted Scotsman would have taken the checker instead. But Jones and old Calhoun held on to cross the line of bricks in first place. Tradition had triumphed at Indy, but only just. A front-engine roadster, fittingly another Watson Offy, this time driven by AJ Foyt, would win only one more 500 in 1964. By 1965, the rear-engine revolution was complete, courtesy of Jim Clark's victory in the Ford-powered Lotus 38 over a 33-car field that had just six front-engine roadsters in it. And in 1967, Parnelli Jones would come within three laps of winning the 500 in a futuristic four-wheel drive racer powered by a gas turbine engine, a car more technically sophisticated than anything running on Europe's Grand Prix tracks at the time. They've seen a lot of change at the Brickyard since the very first 500 mile race. But for me, 1963 remains the pivotal year, the year the Indy 500 began its transition from tradition to modernity. And old Calhoun, the greatest Indy roadster of them all, showed that tradition was gonna go out fighting.